Next is uh, Artyom Shinkarov, and he will uh, talk about the Münchhausen method and combinatorial type theory. Um, so if you have this in your title, the Münchhausen method, then um, you have unlimited bragging rights, <laughs> like the original character. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's a German tale. Um, yeah, I'll tell this. Okay, so I don't, I don't spoil <laughs> your story. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> uh, All right. One second. Yeah. Should come. Hopefully. Okay. Okay. So we are ready. Okay. So yeah, give me just no one more spoilers. More. <laughs> second, just in case. Uh, hope my timing right. I don't overstep. Uh, yeah, but I okay. Right. Hello, indeed. So uh, this is a joint work with. Uh, I should stay with the microphone. This is a joint work with uh, Ambrush, uh, Torsten, and uh, Tomasz. Uh, Ambrush and Tomasz and, and the audience. And indeed, uh, I'm going to tell you a lot of tales, but no lies. So this is Baron Munhausen depicted by Gustave Doré. And this is a character who is famous for returning from a war and telling a lot of tales that people are very suspicious about. But he claims himself that all these tales are actually true. So one of the famous tales that is going to be relevant to our talk today is goes as follows. So on one of the missions, Baron Munhausen fell into a swamp. And in order to salvage himself from this unpleasant situation, the method he used, he pulled himself really hard, his hair, and he managed to escape. And not only he managed to escape himself, he only also managed to salvage his horse who felt in the swamp with him. OK, so what does this have to do with type theory at all? Have you ever dreamt about the type like this? <laughs> Well, yeah, seriously, though, I mean, this is a bit absurd, but what about this? Eh, maybe sometimes. Huh? Uh, so, so this situation, as is depicted on the slide, is sometimes called a very dependent type. So, and, the, and the reason for, well, I mean, the, the definition of a very dependent type is when the type refers to its definition in the body, right? So something like this on the slide. And you may ask, you know, does it make any sense? Well, let's, let's see. The question is, the question of, of the talk and the method of the talk that we're going to present, how, to which extent you can get to this situation, and uh, can you make any sense out of this? So let me give you a particular example that is easy to follow. Um, and uh, this is going to explore this isomorphism. So everybody knows that a product is isomorphic to a function from Booleans because, you know, set cross set is set squared, you know, should, be, should work. Okay, so uh, can we upgrade this result to dependent situations? So what about this? So what if we replace product by sigma? Uh, can we repeat the same trick? Well, uh, it all works fine for the first projection, but for the second projection, remember this is not uh, just a set, this is a, f uh, a, a valid family now. So what argument do we put here? Well, in some sense, in some sense, we could want to write something like this, right? So, okay, you, say, you go exactly the same way, you say, okay, there's a Boolean, so first projection is A, but the second projection is B with a parameter of the first projection, right? But I mean, how, how, do you, how do you put this in, in, in any reasonable theorem prover? Okay, let's, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see if, if this works. Uh, so here's Agda, standard Agda, nothing, nothing changed. So let me start with, with just a, 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 a regular pair, pair, so I've defined this. Let me do some uh, splitting, so I do split. Uh, so, and I can define a number, well, a pair of two natural numbers, so it's going to be, I don't know, Five and three, okay. Um, so this this works, okay. Let's try to repeat this the same exercise for the dependent case. And let's say that we want to have not uh, the natural numbers, but we want to have say nat fin, right? And just to remind you, the fin is going to have 
the type NAT to SAT, right? And it's about, it's, oops, it's a bounded, um, uh, I need to rename this, yeah. So the, the fin is bound, it's natural numbers that are bound by certain type argument, right? So it's, it should be very clear. Okay, so, but this is, is incorrect. So um, um, can we try to do just what was written on the slide? So let's see, so if we say fin, and then what, let me say dp true, okay? So if I try to do this, then Agnes says, blah, no, bad, you know, you don't know what DP is, right? No, surely it doesn't, okay. So are we stuck? Ah, let's see the trick. <laughs> so let's assume, let's assume that, you know, we have the value, okay? All right, so, but I don't, I'm not gonna tell you what it is. So that's just some value that uh, I'm going to define later, okay? In that case, I can complete the definition. I'm going to be inserting something that just requires me to get some integer. It doesn't require me to tell me some exact integer. Okay, fine. But this is not very useful yet because, well, I mean, whenever I, I, I can still probably get this, the first projection in, when, I, when I completed the definition, but, but second projection is, is still problematic. Okay, let's carry on. Let's have another fact and say, okay, I, I'm going to define a theorem uh, and I'm going to say, okay, A, you know what, actually is going to be DP true today, okay? I want this, why not? And now here comes the trick, here comes the trick, you say, ah, and now you know what, Agda? I don't want to deal with this A anymore, actually. I'm going to do this, okay? I'm going to say, okay, I don't, I'm just rewrite this, rewrite. And then, so, well, first of all, if you now look at the type DP, this is exactly what you would expect, <laughs> right? Now, uh, if you actually try to, do, to, to get the definition, then, well, I mean, it might actually work. Let's see. Oh, okay, fine. Uh, let's split. Let's change. Uh, so let's pick a favorite number. Five sounds good, okay. And then let's look at the whole, whole thin five. Oh, why not? Okay, let's, so then just let's complete the definition. Ta-da! <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so you see that you know we 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 had um, kind of a hack how to define a certain version of these very dependent types. What this hack is consists of? Um, this hack consists of of the same thing uh, that people do when they want to cut a certain recursive cycle. For example, uh, if you program in such an advanced language like, I don't know, C, for example, this audience loves C, right? Um, so in C, uh, the order of functions, function definitions matter, right? So if you have mutually dependent functions F and G, um, you know, you, you can't really define them just by giving definitions because if f depends on g, you, you, the, the compiler sees f and it says, okay, but what is g? But g is going to be somewhere below. If you swap them, you have an, you're, you're in the same situation. So uh, that's why in C, people invented declarations. They say, ah, you know, uh, I'm going to tell you there's going to be a function, but I'm not going to tell you what it is. Maybe later, maybe later you will see that. So. Uh, let's learn from C, right? <laughs> so, um, this is exactly what the summary really of the method is, right? So unfortunately, we can't give, give you a, a, a very precise definition, so it's not something that you, you, you can actually you know, try and implement as an algorithm, I think, yet. But at least it gives you some intuition and it can be kind of a discipline that you may want to apply if you find yourself in a situation where these dep very dependent types are needed. So, and we want to think about this problem, uh, well, the solution to this problem as about an algebra in the sense that we want to define an objects, well, we define objects and equations that somehow relate these objects. Now, then we use the declaration trick from C-like language, or it doesn't matter, so, so cutting this, this, this cycle by uh, saying that something is going to come later. And then we bootstrap, so we kind of, we eliminate these, these declarations by using equations. And surely here in, in, in theorem provers, we have much more power to do so rather than in, in, in some C land or something. So this is really the essence of, of, of this trick. And 
then but then you still can, can ask, okay, but why why in the world this is ever useful? Ah, let me show you. So Baron Munhausen tail number one for today, or number two if you consider the horse. Uh, Baron Munhausen once told that there exists a type theory without types, right? So what does this mean? Uh, so think about, some, think about something like a Russell universe, or think about the situation where, where that you have an Agda, right? So in Agda, you don't have to constantly do EL, right? So but lifting between terms and types, you can just write, you know, set is colon set, right? Or set colon set one, I mean, stratification is not really important, but how could you in principle achieve this? So look, here's a, here's a possible signature. Uh, so you and we won't want to have dependent, so we want to have dependent type theory in implementing the CWF style or something like this. So you start with a few definitions, say, okay, context is set, then type is context set, term is context to type to set, okay. Then you say, okay, there is going to be a universe that exists in any type, and then you say, oh, you know what? Actually, I don't want need types anymore. I'm going to equate types with terms of uh, the code universe, right? And then you just eliminate them away. And just to give you a flavor how it can look, I mean, this is just the flavor. This is the incomplete definition, but I hope you can, you can still follow through. So look, you say, okay, context is real, okay? Then you say, okay, type is this declaration uh, that I, I'm going to kill later. Now, context is real. Here are the constructors. You give uh, constructors. Then you say, okay, term is actually also very real. So term is uh, 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 going to be constructed like this, fine. There's going to be a universe. Oops, oh, that's too early. Uh, what do I do? That's too early. Uh, so, 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 yeah. You, 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 there's a universe. There's code for universe that I'm going to explain later. And here's here's the equation that basically eliminates types, as you see in the previous slide. So we say type is just the term of this new universe. Okay, fine. And then actually, when you got get get to define, defining terms, you don't distinguish between types and terms anymore, right? You say okay, universe is a type. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, five constructor is some type construction, and you see you, get, you can get the type as a result and the term as a result because they are the same thing, well, according to this definition at least. And then at the end you say, oh, you know what, actually when I was saying u prime, I meant the constructor u inside of the term, right? And this is kind of Russell-like universe. Okay, Baron Munhausen tale number three or two. Baron Munhausen once told that there exists a type theory without contexts. Oh, right. So, <laughs> so what do we mean by that? So, so um, I want to define using this method uh, a model of dependent type theory with no contexts. Okay, dependent types, everything. So universe, blah blah blah, but no context. So the signature might look something like this. So you say types, not indexed. You say terms tied to set and universe. Okay, and then and then you try to define everything else so that it behaves exactly the same as normal CWF uh, uh, for dependent types. Uh, you can ask yourself, okay, but can you write anything sensible in such a type theory if you don't have contexts? Well, I mean, uh, what do you do with variables? Well, people thought about this problem long enough and they came up with a solution called combinators, right? So combinators solve exactly this problem, right? So you can still write a lot of sensible things complete language, but you never have to deal with variables, right? So the, the dream of ours, and basically that was the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the main interest uh, to why, why I wanted to use this, to, to, to define dependent type theory with combinators, but in the definition we want to avoid using contexts. Okay, so how this such a, such a uh, uh, combinators would be typed? Uh, let me start with just the regular Agda to, to, uh, to explain the types first. So this, these are the constructors that we're going to have. Well, we'll have universe, but in essence, that's it. So we're going to have pi, we're going to have dependent k and dependent s, right? And, uh, and the strategy when we type these combinators is going to be that we are going to use the maximum dependencies possible, right? So see here, k, it's, it's polymorphic over arguments. Arguments b depends on a, and the, the combinator signature says, okay, you have a, then you have b that depends on a, and you get back a, right? And you do the same with, with s. You, so you define a, b, c that, that kind of depends on the, each other in a telescopic way. 
And then you say, okay, the, so the f, the first function is going to have a, and b depends on a, and c depends on both of them. Then this thing is, is again, a depend, b depends on a, and this thing says, okay, you have a, and then you have c that depends on a, and f, this f of a, right? So you can, if you maximally propagate all dependencies. If you do this, then I think it has been shown on, on paper that it's possible, it's, it's, it's really, you know, you can, you can encode uh, 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 the, the, all, the, all the combinators, or, well, all, all, all the constructions. Okay, so why this is difficult? So let me, let me show you some pain first before I, I get to, to the solution. So if you are in this situation, oh, I'm actually, I'm giving out away the answer right now. <laughs> so if you are in the situation and then you, oops, and then you want to uh, say, okay, but what is my, my, my type going to be? So this is, this is a, an Agda way of writing things, but you know, you're in, in the language that we're about to define, you, you, you can't have lambdas, you can't have nice things. So okay, you have to somehow decide, let's leave the, the polymorphic arguments first in place, and then let's think about what, what this definition is going to turn into. Oh, you know, you have to basically uh, apply some bracket abstraction. And you think, okay, that, that's easy. Okay, I'm going to just doing this. Oh, but what do I put here? Well, I need to have some lambda A that's going to do something. And then, right, I, I can't have lambdas, but maybe I'll get rid of them later. And you say, yeah, okay, now I need to get off this arrow uh, there. So let me do something maybe like this, B A, and then, oh, right. But this A doesn't fit into pi anymore because, well, you see, I mean, <coughs> pi requires a family as a second argument, but A is just a set. Okay, so, but I, I don't need dependency, so I have to define some K combinator to kill this A and to do something like this. But I can't use this combinator because that's something I'm defining. And this is the type of the combinator. So you see, we have a problem that <laughs> in order to define the type for dependent combinator, we need to have some combinators already in place, right? And they don't have to be full, they don't have to expose full dependencies in the types, but there has to be something, right? So you have to, in, in order to give the type for dependent combinator in this combinator calculus, you have to have at least simpler versions of the same combinators, right? And that's why this is actually mind boggling. And you know, even for this dependent K example, the, the correct answer is this. Uh, so, I mean, you'd need to have S and K at least. You can define C in terms of S and K, but uh, you know, it's, it's not completely trivial. And if you look at S, then the definition grows even larger, okay. So this is, the, this is, why, this is why it takes just a lot of effort to do this. Now, um, if we follow the first attempt, so the, 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 kind of the, the, the way it went, so we say, okay, let's, let's just uh, uh, go forward. And the first attempt was, uh, yeah, let's, go, let's get with our signature, let's get rid of the types, and let's try to start with a non-dependent arrow first uh, in order to, because you, know, you, you need non-dependent non arrow to define some type signature for the combinators. Okay, so we say we have non-dependent arrow, uh, we have an application, and then we want to internalize this arrow because you see this arrow lives in the Agda function space, but we actually want to kind of restrict ourselves to the functions that you can generate within the language that we are defining. Oh, and then the problem is this, when you try to eliminate this in the same Munhausen way, uh, Agda loops, right? And the first reaction that we had when we discussed this is, oh, stupid Agda, why can't you implement rewrite rules correctly? And that's something that I went to uh, Jasper with, and I said, Jasper, why your Agda doesn't work? And Jasper said, uh, excuse me, <laughs> you know. So the problem, the problem that occurs is this, uh, it turns out when you uh, expand the, the rewrites, uh, as I explained, then uh, the definition of the simple arrow in the expansion of application in the hidden parameter extracts to u, u arrow u. I mean, I can skip the details why, and it just can follow. So, so the, the hidden parameter, it's, as it's, uh, as it's uh, uh, polymorphic, expands to u arrow u, but you say, okay, but how did the, the dependent pair trick work? Well, dependent, tri dependent pair trick worked because uh, uh, this thing allows following rewrite rules application, right? So it kind of it rewrites uh, ad infinitum uh, uh, in, in the current system, whereas in dependent pair, you rewrite once and it's in kind of in some sort of normal form. So sorry, Jasper, I was not wrong, right? <laughs> so, but this is a problem that we don't really have a solution for. So, so uh, uh, what we do instead, 
we refer to the family. And from the movie Godfather, we know that the family is very important, right? So um, what do we do? Uh, so we define the, the, this kind of combinator from a family which morally is uh, X to Z, right, or X to U. And then if we start with the family, then we can immediately define pi straight away. And with the help of an extra combinator, we can define the simple arrow straight away. Now, I think I'm going to spare you details of the encoding, but actually uh, this, this type check. So we have a version of dependent combinators. And maybe just to mention, we have the, the way we use this, we didn't uh, uh, go through all the simple combinators. We defined the combinators that we had to use in order to give a definition, uh, in order to uh, just bootstrap these things. And it's actually, it works very nice. And then the, the, the hope is that we're going to eliminate them away by closing the loop. OK, I'm almost done. Now, the, <laughs> the remaining bits that are actually nobody of, from, of us wants to do is this. So we have the version of the combinators that are polymorphic in these hidden arguments, right? So you see, if you, if you look here, you see we still have these implicit y's and z uh, that are living in the Agda function space. But in order to properly internalize this, uh, you'd need to introduce something like, like you know, this. That's, I pre-generated the, 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 the answer. But uh, the problem is that, well, uh, you have to encode this in Agda, and you don't have uh, implicit, well, you almost don't have implicit uh, inference anymore because Agda is too confused, right? So you have to provide <laughs> all the implicit things here. And, you know, uh, <laughs> so that's something where we're where we a bit stuck in thinking whether maybe you can pre-generate this or that. So, so this, that's, that's the state of the results. So the summary is that, you know, we discovered this Minhausen method, we have uh, uh, an application that seemed to work, and uh, we, we, we almost, we have a good progress with combinator TT, but we are stuck with basically a technical problem that nobody wants to tackle. And as a side uh, uh, a project, uh, we have a very nice definition of the correspondence between simply typed uh, combinators and lambda calculus in a fully algebraic way. And you can talk with us offline, we can tell you more. Um, just to give myself a big finale, uh, I'm going to show you the last fragments of the movie about Baron Munhausen. So this is Baron Munhausen, and in one of the tales, he says that he traveled to the moon, and apparently the method to travel to the moon is climb into the cannon and ask somebody to shoot you there. And people, when they heard this tale, are very upset, and they ask Baron Munhausen to repeat this experiment, and that's, you see him doing this, climbing to the cannon, which he may or may not reach. Uh, but before he does so, in one of the other closing scenes, he says something like this, that Baron Munhausen is famous not because he traveled to the moon, but because he never lies. <laughs> and I think at this point <laughs> I should stop, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. All right, do you have a Short time for questions. Um, yes, or well, Matthew. <laughs> Do you still get reduction behavior with this rewrite plus postulate trick? Postulate, then postulate, then rewrite. Can you actually normalize? Well, I mean, it, it's very much in, in our case, yes, because we try to know what you do, but if you think about this as a general method, then surely you can you know, kill you, or shoot yourself in the foot and it, it all breaks. But currently, we seem to be fine. It, you know, we, we're not finished yet, but uh, the hope is that, so again, the, the, the reasoning we have is that, you, you know, if you do not, if you don't have kind of uh, references that go all around, so we never do forward reference, we always try to do backward references, and if you have this discipline, then it seems to be fine. But, you know, we might find some problem that we haven't seen before. It seems to work, but no guarantees yet. <laughs> Yeah, no question, but just a small remark. At least the first example you showed, you don't need any rewrite rules to do that. Agda just accepts it if you forwardly declare the A and then define it afterwards. Okay, fine. But uh, I mean, so but it just, yeah. So this is mainly just Agda allowing very dependent things and nothing with the. Uh,
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very I mean, close, making it worse. Right. So again, I, 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 I don't think that the the Agda root with rewrite rules is a correct one. If you think about, you know, if this is a real thing, which we are not 100% sure, then you will want to extend the Ethereum proof for real because you know, yeah. rewrite rules is a huge hammer, right? You can you can do a lot of damage, and this is a very specific thing. So you can have something that deals with very dependent types more carefully and things about cycles. Yeah. So introduce some more more. Um, so I think indeed, if you want to work with this seriously, you need to be much more careful than Agda. With of course. Not reducing or not unfolding things to each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you, you might need to introduce some laziness, but the problem is that you know we are not yet sure that this thing even works. So, 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 uh, not there yet. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, can you pass it to Henny? Oh, yeah. sorry. Uh, just briefly to follow up on this, uh, I was wondering the problem you mentioned where ACTA is basically unfolding infinitely. Would it be possible to kind of have a data type that blocks? the rewriting, so to say, okay, you, because what happened in the example, you had one case where you want to work with general types, but then you have your universe. <coughs> so if you would have a type that says, well, this is a general embedding, but then I have my case for the universe, for the universe I don't rewrite, but only in the other case. Well, I, d I think that, that the rewrite rules might be not a, as advanced, and the, and the other trouble is that you really would like to, to do something like this, because you, I mean, what you can do, you can, you can define, a, you can rewrite into something that is different from the, the arrow, but you well for for higher orderness of the language you want to actually have this arrow because you know otherwise you can you can try to to do less higher order and and try to restrict somehow in that case you, you'll find but I mean if you want to have proper higher order things then uh, I, I'm not sure uh, maybe maybe there is a, a method but we just didn't find find one so okay. yeah okay final question Anton um, if we um if you use the uh, relative rea realizability model mm -hmm. of type three, would you then get uh, can show that all these types and terms exist, uh, functions exist? Well, <laughs> I, I'm not sure. So it seems that if you if you define a model of this and then you and then you ask for all the equations, then uh, they are <laughs> fine. They seem to be justified in in in, in the model uh, with realizability. I don't know, we never tried, so we, we, we have to see. Yeah. Don't know. Okay, but uh, then let's thank you again and. Um,